Across the Fence, I'm Fran Stoddard. Today we're going to meet a Vermont professor whose research centers on the brain and involves the emotional and physical health of various populations, from LGBTQ plus individuals to older people living in rural areas. Our guest is also exploring health barriers, equity, and well-being in these diverse groups. I want to welcome Barbara Colombo, a professor at Champlain College, where she runs the Behavioral Neuroscience Lab. Barbara, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to have this opportunity. Great. Uh, so for decades in this country, there have been discussions and studies about health care and health disparities. What's your specific focus or perspective on these issues? Yeah, I uh, started by focusing on the specific uh, demographics of the aging population in Vermont. And um, a lot of Vermonters, uh, aging Vermonters, lives in rural area, and that was one of the first focuses that catch my attention. And then um, my research also has been focusing a lot on barriers and equity that LGBTQ plus uh, individual face overall. And uh, there is a, a substantial LGBTQ plus aging population in Vermont. So these were the two main um, population that I thought deserve more attention um, when trying to study uh, possible health um, in, problems in health access or way to increasing their well-being and reducing their stress when health is uh, and health access are uh, involved. All right. So, so interesting. So um, you're, I'm interested in why you chose to focus on the LGBTQ plus, maybe the o older LGBTQ plus, or is it, it, and also aging people. So are there statistics that are saying it's it's difficult? I mean, I had a, I had a friend who ha actually did move from a rural area because it just it was difficult. It's a professional, yeah. and it was a small town, and it just didn't work, and he moved to a big city. Yes. So for the rural area, you know, in the U.S., there are like approximately 61 million individuals living living in rural areas, and more uh, than 15 to 17 percent of these are uh, 65 and up. And depending on where you live, um, there uh, there are health barriers, and that this can have an impact on um, overall health, and especially especially on on mental stress when you think you it when you just consider the fact that it's hard to have access to that services. And for LGBTQ+, there are additional statistics uh, that regardless of where you live, um, the physical and mental health of aging LGBTQ plus seems to be um, po more poor than uh, people who do not belong to this community. And this may have many, uh, many reasons, but not enough research has been done. Um, of course, there's link to the fact that by having a history of discrimination, um, it's harder to perceive um, healthcare as a safe place. And so, um, sharing specific uh, health related uh, concerns becomes as more stressful and by not sharing that of course affects the overall health outcomes and then there is also a, um, a lack of services both for the aging lgbtq plus and for care partners of this population and um, understanding exactly how the dynamics work and what is needed to um, improve the situation is what I'm trying to do. And I try to add to the research that is already out there and then in some areas a little lacking. Sure. So very important, uh, really seeing this hidden population. So where yeah. do you see your line of research going? What do you hope? Uh, yeah, so with um, a group of, of students and interns, we. Um, I decided to focus on uh, communication between the aging LGBTQ plus community and their healthcare providers, and to do that in uh, in a way that could be um, fun and interactive and be perceived as doable and not too overwhelming. We have um, developed an app um, that um, that you can see here is called LGBTQ Quest Plus. Um, that is uh, structured as almost a game where um, providers can uh, 
engage in scenarios um, where they uh, interact with LGBTQ plus patients. There are resources that both patients and providers can uh, refer to. And also there are some um, exercises on uh, how to uh, manage difficult communication, how to build trust, uh, how to uh, focus more on empathy. And this is both for providers and uh, for patients. And um, uh, we had a, a lot of fun with my students building this and beta testing, and we hope that this eventually will be used and possibly make a difference. F fantastic. Well, Champlain is known for, for making these these games and, and cool apps. Is is the app available yet for patients or, and providers who are interested? We are we are in the beta testing phase, so hopefully it will be uh, available soon. Um, first results from beta testing are positive, so we are optimistic. Awesome. So what kind of uh, unique concerns about rural areas are you trying to tackle with this, this app and, and the other work you're doing? Yeah, so um, research on the rural areas specifically um, has uh, focused a lot on um, the differences in physical health and um, other um, physical related factors like number of visits to primary care, uh, time um, between uh, a problem um, is reported and the follow-up um, visit and so on. Uh, what has not been studied that much is uh, the impact on um, psychological health and uh, mental distress that not having easy access to um, health providers may cause for this population. And also um, not a lot of research has focused on what could be some protective factors. So if this problem exists and we expect it having a toll on the overall um, mental health of individuals living in this area, what can be done uh, to minimize this and uh, improve the situation and increase well-being? And this is the main focus, my main focus for this specific topic. Terrific. And, and so s some people um, may have heard of the term cognitive reserve. You brought up protective factor and you, you, um, you sense that or you feel that cognitive reserve could be a protective factor for dementia or, or, or other issues. Can you elaborate and, and open that up for us a little bit? Yeah, so cognitive reserve is um, a term that has been uh, brought up when people were trying to understand why some individuals age better than others. And basically, I, I like to think about it as um, like sending our brain to the gym and to some extent uh, by doing a lot of things, especially things that we like. So it's not. Uh, and when you do that throughout your life or even as a as a training, um, that increases your brain ability to respond to any form of damage or stress. And some could be just normal aging, some could be neurodegenerative disorders, like as you mentioned, uh, dementia or Parkinson, but also um, any form of a stress or trauma. We did some research in COVID times and we realized that people with higher cognitive reserve, even if they had severe cases of COVID, had much lower post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms that individuals uh, that had uh, similar uh, physical and mental uh, strains, but lower cognitive reserve. So that was a strong protective factors. Um, we also find on aging um, Vermonters that um, work with us on uh, a training to improve their cognitive reserve during COVID and online training. Um, mm -hmm. The the group that had the cognitive reserve training had an increased well-being just after a few weeks of that training uh, during the lockdown compared to a control group that just um, didn't have that specific cognitive reserve focused training. So what we um, expect to see and hope to see is that um, higher cognitive reserve in rural areas can help um, increasing, um, decreasing the stress linked to uh, more difficult access to healthcare and also maybe uh, have people uh, show more resilience and even more um, uh, willingness to go the extra mile to find uh, health access and to adhere to uh, whatever is needed to promote their well-being with a much lower level of stress. Right. And, you know, it's, it's not easy doing research in, in rural areas. It's, it's far away. Um, are you hoping that the app helps with this research? Are you doing other things to um, 
to really gather information and, and, and what results um, are you looking for? Yeah, we are hoping that the help will help. We are also trying to set up um, interviews with um, uh, individuals and we are trying to be as, flexi as flexible as possible. So we are using um, uh, virtual interviews, phone interviews, and then uh, I have interns with cars that can drive around and <laughs> do interviews. And, and then we're hoping that by partnering with local um, senior centers, for example, we can provide um, training for increasing cognitive reserve or any other um, um, empowerment uh, opportunities that might be needed as a follow-up to the research that we're doing. So if somebody wants to contact you about this research and what you're doing and, and help you out, how should they reach you? Uh, they can um, send me an email or, and you can see it here, um, I have a website where the, research, the open uh, research projects are listed and uh, I'm always very happy to hear from anyone and i um, very excited for uh, talking about what I'm doing, explaining more or uh, involving people in research in any way they would like to be involved. It's very exciting and you're doing research on a number on, on, on oncology, decision making, chronic um, conditions. This is wonderful for students. How do you involve your students? You're, you're using them quite quite a bit and giving them real world experience in, in this. Yes, uh, I try to set up my classes uh, as a service learning classes and that gives the opportunity for students to work in real life and the service learning opportunities are usually linked to this topic so that I can have them work with the community and also provide the supervision that is linked to my expertise. And then um, I always have uh, amazing interns at the Behavioral Neuroscience Lab, and they're also very involved uh, and hands on on those projects. So that's wonderful for me. I, I think it's a way of staying young and uh, learning a lot <laughs> from the new generations. Awesome. Barbara Colombo, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, and good luck to you and your students. Thank you so much for having me. It was a wonderful experience. And once again, Thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.